Hello guys, uh, very good evening. Hope I'm audible and visible. Uh, welcome everyone. So today we are going to have one more uh, course for postgraduates, especially students who are in JR1. If you are a NEET PG aspirant, the first initial half of the class will definitely be helpful for you where I'll be discussing your uh, common cases which came in the lab. And then maybe the latter half will be useful for a uh, postgraduate, might not be much for an undergraduate. And if you are willing uh, to take a part of it, you can come as well, fine. So let's start, a uh, few things to start with. Uh, if you are a postgraduate and listening to this, do share this information to your undergrads, your juniors, whoever wants to use an academy. Uh, there are lots of classes which are free. If you want a subscription, you can go ahead as well. Again, for every pathology postgraduates, we will be conducting special classes, which everything will be free uh, on uh, Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. It might differ sometime. For Saturdays, I'm, uh, I'm dedicating it to entirely to uh, first year postgraduates and Wednesdays and your Saturdays are primarily for your um, uh, second and third year postgraduates. Uh, for, in that session, we are covering soft tissue and for the first year, we are in the process of hematology. Fine. Okay. These are few batches, which uh, for an undergraduate might be of help, fine. So the first uh, first half, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a few cases which came uh, in the lab. Actually, the cases uh, whichever I'm going to discuss uh, in the evening. Good evening, Debraj. In the evenings after the duty hours, if some sample comes in the night, my technician used to share the image of uh, photos of the peripheral smear and also the differential count, uh, the entire Coulter values. I'm going to give you the Coulter values. And I want you to comment on whatever comes to your mind. If you're a postgraduate PG here, I want you to comment on a complete diagnosis, good evening, Kruti. If you're an undergrad, just look at the pointers and comment on whatever you are seeing, fine? So let's try to learn uh, and try to report in the first half. And the second half will be for postgraduates alone, fine? So this is a Kulta value. I want you to look at it. Hello, Aryan. Uh, want you to look at it. Have a quick look at all the values and comment on whatever you are seeing and what you would have reported, what you would have asked for. This is just about evaluation of the case in a real time. Hi, Wasima. So I'm, I'm gonna mute myself for a few seconds. So just read through all the values, see whatever is important, whatever you think is required for the attention of a pathologist and report on that. Okay, shall we start? The first question, why was this event sent to a pathologist? Because, uh, or is there any flag which as a pathologist I should be concerned about uh, which my technician cannot handle? Why was this alarming? Microstic hypochromic blood pressure, Anuj, okay. Anything else you are looking in addition to microstic hypochromic blood pressure? You're right in that. MCV is less, increased WBC. Uh, okay, Devraj, you're right as well. Anything else? Is there anything more alarming than uh, whatever you guys said? I'm not saying you're wrong. Is there anything else which uh, requires attention? Leukocytosis. Uh, see, in a real life, 12,600 is definitely increased WBC as per book. But I'm not going to be much worried about, especially when the uh, WBC distribution, the neutrophils and my lymphocytes and more or less normal, right? RDW CV is high. Anisocytosis, great, great. Alicia as well as what's? Anything else, anything else alarming here? Hemoglobin is increased, right? See, this is my main concern. You guys concentrate on many things. So a way to read any Coulter report first is look for your RBC, WBC platelets. You have to look for the values first. Then yes, obviously MCV, MCH, everything comes into play. Here hemoglobin is elevated, right? Hemoglobin of 19 is definitely on a higher side, right? So like Abhi said that it's case of polycythemia. This microcytic anemia, uh, is there obviously so a polysthemic patient can also be iron deficient keep that in mind any patient with polysthemia whenever your bone marrow is going to proliferate more than it's going to do with the same amount of iron can i say that bone marrow will be in uh, relative deficiency of iron yes 
So here my problem is not the iron deficiency anemia. There is polycythemia. Maybe because of that, I could have a slight secondary functional iron deficiency, right? Great. FT low, I will not comment on polycythemia vera here, right? My hematocrit is elevated. My hemoglobin is also elevated. So if you are going to report this smear, I have to give a report. I have to give an impression. My impression, like you guys said, is polycythemia. So it's a real life patient, right? So what will you advise? Because I cannot uh, give polycythemia vera as a diagnosis just with these uh, investigations. Because there's a criteria for polycythemia rubra vera. In order to diagnose polycythemia rubra vera, it has to undergo a few things. It has to be repeated more than once and many things are there, right? So how will you write out? It's definitely polysthemia. What are the next things you want to ask the uh, treating physician, surgeon or physician, whoever it is? Which is more common, secondary polysthemias or primary polysthemia? Because primary polysthemia is your polysthemia rubra vera, which, is, which you think is more common. A Z clicks bone marrow biopsy is yes. I, that's definitely in the pipeline, but I would not think it upfront. Because whenever you see a patient of polysthemia, the first possibility I want you to look for secondary causes because secondary causes is undoubtedly more common than primary right I am not going to ask for a primary polysthemia vera or going to do a bone marrow biopsy or anything of that sort right it could be a just can this finding be just due to smoking is that possible it's absolutely possible right so when you have a peripheral smear finding of polysthemia I don't want you to always think it will be a polysthemia rubra vera fine right so ask for history rule out all the secondary causes dehydration can cause this spurious polysthemia right so there are multiple causes it could be a, it could be a patient with copd that may be oxygen deprivation hypoxia which increases your erythropoietin levels right so there are multiple causes the first is to rule out secondary causes that should be a report polysthemia impression definitely a polysthemic smear come on say that uh, first to ask for a detailed history and evaluate the patients for all known secondary causes of polysthemia and repeat the peripheral smear again after a week or two. If it persists again, the same polysthemic picture and if there is no other secondary known cause, yes, then I would advise whatever you guys said, a bone marrow biopsy or my, um, you can give a uh, JAK2 mutation if you think it's a polysthemia rubra vera, fine, okay. Uh, can you, any of you guys say that is there any finding in the same peripheral smear uh, CBC value which might suggest polysthemia rubra vera? Any other surrogate findings here which might suggest it's a neoplasm rather than saying in, uh, it's a uh, secondary polysthemia. Anything else? Anything? Uh, hematocrit is definitely elevated Kruti that will not again just suggest me see few pointers for me which uh, perfect J I have to look for WBC count see my WBC count also here is elevated when I consider a polysthemia rubra vera it is not a neoplasm of RBCs alone it's a myeloproliferative neoplasm right so where I am having a problem with the stem cell where RBC takes an upper hand I do have a problem in the WBC as well as platelet lineage also in a case of a polycythemia rubra vera. So when you have an increased WBC count and an increased platelet counts, again, I am not saying it is not secondary. My confidence of thinking of a polycythemia rubra vera is a little bit more, fine. Keep this in mind. Whenever you see a patient with polycythemia, look for these two. If those two are also elevated, which means it's like a pan myelosis, right? It's a pan myelosis. Pan myelosis is one of the classical features seen in polycythemia rubra vera which has been seen here on the peripheral smear, smear as well, fine? Okay, great. We'll go to the next uh, patient. Just have a look at the patient and comment on it. Now this came today. Right, so let's see what you're going to look at this. Again, have look at everything, then comment on what is the problem, fine? I'll mute myself for 30 seconds. Just have a look at everything and then comment on what, what you think.
Devraj, I think I zoomed in. Great. Right. See, this is a perfect thing. Great. I do accept that this is a classical case of pancytopenia, right? as all of you said. right? So when I'm going to see a peripheral smear of a pancytopenia, again, Manoj, can I call it aplastic anemia immediately? Is it possible for me to call it aplastic anemia? It's not possible for me to call it aplastic anemia with this picture alone. The better uh, terminology here will be pancytopenia, right? Okay, immature granulocytes. Yeah, IG stands for immature granulocytes. That's 7.7 .7 that is definitely elevated here, fine? So I'm having a patient with pancytopenia. Uh, I'm not coming into a conclusion of what is the di differential diagnosis. Before going into the differential diagnosis, uh, there are plenty of cause of pancytopenia, right? Uh, can I say this could just be a megaloblastic anemia? Is that possible? Uh, RBC, MCV, 98, a little bit on the higher side. It could still be possible, right? But still I have to look in the microscopy what it is. So when you have a Coulter value, which is suggestive of a pancytopenia, what all will you look for in the WBC or in the RBC or in the platelets on a peripheral smear? Because I want you to know what all you have to look for. If you know what you're going to look for, definitely you will search for it. If you are not understanding, again, what your mind doesn't know, your eye doesn't see, right? So tell me in a peripheral smear, what all things you will look for, particularly in this patient, keeping in mind your CBC value here is pancytopenia. What all you look for? If you can comment whatever comes to your mind, you may be right, you may not be, we are going to learn together more. First thing, I have to look for any blasts or any atypical cells. See, this is very, very important. Uh, like, fine, I'll go with Anuj as well. What Fava said that macrocytes I have to look for, whether they are there, macrovelocytes, segmented neutrophils I have to look for. But what is more important for me is the blasts and the atypical cells. Uh, since I said your um, megaloblastic anemia, you are going in terms of megaloblastic anemia yes i will definitely look for megaloblastic anemia i'm not ignoring that but what is more important for me is blast and atypical cells right? because i'm going to report this patient can this patient could be a case of an um, let's say an uh, a look sub leukemic or an a leukemic leukemia is that possible it is completely possible right i need to look for everything it can be a patient with an sub leukemic or an a leukemic leukemia if it's a sub leukemic leukemia, uh, if there are like four five percent blast, that might not be exactly picked by a Coulter, but still Coulter gave me a value of IG stands for immature granulocytes, right? The six part Coulter it will not give me the blast percentage here. It gave me it gave me immature granulocytes a seven point seven. So definitely I have to look carefully in the microscopy. Is there any blast or immature cell seen? Fine. So what do I mean by atypical cells? See blast I know which is immature cells, right? When I say atypical cells, I have to look for lymphoid lineage, right? Especially when you have a patient with a pancytopenia, elderly person with a pancytopenia, please look at the lymphoid lineage. Because though it is a very rare finding, I want you to keep in mind that hairy cell leukemia can also present with the pancytopenia, right? Definitely hairy cell leukemia present with the pancytopenia. Uh, so more so here because my monocyte count is 0.01 percentage, uh, which is very less which is definitely very less, right? So I have to look for the lymphoid lineage. Are there any atypical lymphocytes with hairy projections there or not? Again, differential diagnosis. I don't know what this uh, smear is going to turn to be. I just reported as a pancytopenia. I have to look the smear tomorrow only. Just now he sent the image. I'll def definitely update you on the group what it is, fine? If I don't have anything, like there are no blast percentage, there are no atypical cells, right? Next, what will be your report? I'm going to say that pancytopenia for evaluation, what other investigations you will ask for in this patient so that I can come to a complete diagnosis? What are the other investigations you would want in these patients so that we can arrive to a diagnosis? Uh, Sri Devi, good. I have to look for teardrop cells. I do want some other investigations. Do you want to give in the impression? Okay, please do this, do that, or give any history you want. 
first thing uh, yes bone marrow examination is important for me fine before bone marrow examination and confirmation anything the first history i want is is the patient having sepsis is the patient having any fever because fever can also destroy everything it can become pancytopenic perfect z a retic count will help me a retic count will definitely tell me whether it is pancytopenia due to failure or pancytopenia due to destruction it can easily tell me the value right bone marrow good retic count is a good start you can ask for retic close count anything else you guys want the one more important thing is ask for the history of splenomegaly if spleen is present or not right if there is an extremely big massive splenomegaly can i say that just a massive splenomegaly alone can cause uh, pancytopenia is there possibility there is a possibility right there is a possibility there is something called as an hypersplenism where just a massive splenomegaly alone will consume everything will consume my rbc wbc and platelets and destroy them right let's say that if it is if the patient has a massive splenomegaly and let's say there are no atypical cells if it is hypersplenism what do you think will happen to reticulocyte count will it be reduced or elevated what will happen to retic count in case of hypersplenism will it be reduced or elevated perfect it will be elevated right so retic count plays a very very important role in evaluating case of pancytopenia to know whether there is a bone marrow failure causing this or an peripheral destruction causing that right so that's very important retic count will be elevated in case of an hypersplenism if it is an aplastic anemia retic count automatically be reduced right this should be there bone marrow examination based on other finding fine and also your uh, other clinical inputs is required in order to completely evaluate this patient right i'll update you in for sure what happens in this patient in future right ignore this part this was written by my technician uh, that's not my handwriting it's definitely not that good right so read through the values uh, sorry for it being little bit blurred and comment on your diagnosis i'll mute myself for 30 seconds uh, look at every single possible value there and comment what you think Okay, open to discussion. Yes, Kazumi, myelofibrils also allows splenomegaly with pancytopenia. You're right. Okay, normocytic, normochromic, fine. What's has gone with uh, immature granulocytes being more? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, Seventeen percentage of immature granulocytes is definitely more. Anything else? I'll show you the peripheral smear also. I do have a image of the peripheral smear. Right, so I have approximately seven thousand four hundred WBC count. RBC is decent here. Normocytic, normochromic picture. Platelets are decent here. The only problem for me here is my immature granulocytes. IG stands for immature granulocytes, which is seventeen percent. Maximum it can be point one, point two, right? This uh, lymphocytopenia. Uh, I wouldn't call it a lymphocytopenia. My problem is not my lymphocytes here. My immature granulocytes are a little bit more, right? Uh, my entire focus should be on immature granulocytes, right? So my technician also did send an image. I am going to show you the image. Tell me what it is and how we will report this patient. Okay, this is the image what he sent to me. I hope it is visible. So tell me, it's the same patient's image. Tell me what it could be and what you would have reported. He had sent multiple images. I'm just focusing only one of them. Because it's an important learning lesson for any uh, pathology who's listening to this. Okay, what do you see here? You can comment. You might be right. You might be wrong. Doesn't matter. But I just want you to comment. What are these? Okay, multiple myeloma, NRBC, 
fine i do want other comments as well i said it's good that you guys have started plasma cells great z any, any more any more comments plasma cell again fine um, okay if you're an undergraduate it's fine uh, it's a learning lesson for a postgraduate uh, see one thing uh, the RBC here are not having Roulet formation, ignore that, fine. Uh, the RBC is not in the right side of the smear, so it's not a Roulet formation, ignore that, perfect. Uh, I do have cells which are looking fully completely hemoglobinized. I do have cells which are looking grenaded. Uh, most of you guys concentrated on this, right? There were two comments, uh, either is an NRBC, like what Barbie said, and predominant of you said it's a plasma cell. It is not a blast. A blast will have a very high NC ratio. It is not a blast. I'll ignore that for now. Fine. Okay. It does look like a plasma cell, right? It is not an NRBC because when you look at the cytoplasm here, does it look like an RBC? No. The cytoplasm doesn't look like an RBC, right? So it's not an NRBC. So can it be a plasma cell? Fine. You must have read about plasma cell in your undergraduates, right? So if it is a plasma cell, uh, am I right in saying that there are multiple pointers in the nucleus itself? The nucleus of a plasma cell will be heterochromatin or a mixture of U and heterochromatin. So again, basics are very, very important. I don't want you to forget them. The nucleus of a plasma cell will be heterochromatin or a mixture of U and heterochromatin. You must have definitely read, they have something called a clock phase, clock phase chromatin, right? A perinuclear half, a clock phase chromatin, a mixture on U, U and heterochromatin, right? Perfect. So do you see this nucleus, if you want to zoom it a little bit, looking at this nucleus, does it have a mixture of U and heterochromatin? It doesn't look like a clock face, right? Can I say it's looking more like a condensed heterochromatin? And like you guys said, are you seeing a perinuclear halo here? No, right? This looks more or less condensed. It is more or less in condensed chromatin. That's my first thing. And there is no perinuclear half, right? Great. Uh, do you guys agree for that okay so now why i particularly put this uh, images i want i don't want you to miss this in future fine so can i say that this nucleus here could it be an apoptotic cell is that a possibility will an apoptotic cell have condensed nucleus is there a possibility or not yes that is a possibility, right? Okay. The entire exercise of this case is just for that. So this cell here is a degenerated cell, right? So when you see a smear, you should always keep in mind whether it's a stored sample. See, because if you don't know that, we might miss it. And when you miss it, and it's a degenerated cell, can a culter definitely consider them as an immature granulocyte? Because it looks bigger, not a well-formed nucleus, right? Ulta mistakes a cell immature as an immature granulocyte. They are actually apoptotic cells. They are very older cells. There must have been a sample which is kept for 24 hours. If you take a sample from the patient today, now, it should be processed at earliest possible. Fine. If it's not processed very early, it's going to cause lots of changes. That's one of the uh, stored storage artifact which should be picked up, which will be picked up by a culture as an immature granulocyte only. So looking into a smear, you don't see any immature cell. There were no blast. It is full of degenerated cells. So I'm going to ignore them, cancel the smear, ask them to send a fresh sample. Fine. Great. Kruti, you are right in saying that my apoptotic cell should be smaller. Why is it looking bigger? Fine. See, the apoptotic cell being smaller, uh, it's more in favor for a tissue. Whatever you read in apoptosis in your general pathology is more in favor for tissue. If you look at this cell also, uh, the nucleus is shrunken. If I can take a neutrophil, a normal neutrophil will be more or less this size. So you have an RBC here. The size is almost more or less uh, equal to an RBC, right? Slightly bigger. That's actually the normal size of neutrophil. Neutrophil can go up to 14 micron, which is twice the size of RBC. Normal RBC is four, uh, 7 micron, right? So here, the cell is decent, might be shrunken. But what is more important for me is the nuclear changes. And the background, you are seeing lots of crenation artifacts. Some are small, some are big. Those are also suggestive findings for a degenerated sample, right? So when you're seeing a sample, don't always believe on the CBC value given by the culture. 
keep an eye for degenerated sample storage artifact as well fine okay we will go to one more case uh, let's see if we can pick up these case i hope all the findings are visible here okay uh, i'll mute myself for a few seconds comment on it possibilities okay what's this right bang on it's lymphocytosis right a lymphocytosis right a classical case of a lymphocytosis great kazumi's uh, wording is much more better she has said clpd clpd stands for chronic lymphoproliferative disorders right clpd will be a better terminology here because a 62000 wbc count and of them 86% being lymphocytes definitely i'll think of that okay anuj can i call it a leukemoid reaction leukemoid reaction is not a correct terminology here right because in leukemoid reaction it's the neutrophilic granulocyte lineage which increases right the granulocytic lineage increases but here my granulocytes are okay uh, it's uh, been predominated by lymphocytes right so i will not call it a leukemoid reaction or a leukemia my primary diagnosis on this coulter value will be still your chronic lymphoproliferative disorder like sadia said that that's definitely a mild thrombocytopenia i think that can be attributed i don't call it a thrombocytopenia when it is uh, 1.29 lakhs the word thrombocytopenia should be used when it's less than a lakh the terminologies are important this is a low normal platelet count nothing much to worry about the platelet count here fine here this is very important for me right so a smear was done and uh, these were some photos uh, which he sent me can you have a look at it and come to a conclusion is it possible for you to come to a conclusion by these two images you have to get used to this you will get uh, images of these qualities only in your future so get used to this now itself Okay, now your diagnosis. Do you guys want to change CLPD to something else? Smart cells, right? Great. Fine. You do see smart cells. Z clicks. Is it CML or CLL? Perfect. I do have a lymphocyte. You do have a lymphocyte. You have a lymphocyte. And there are smart cells. There are smart cells available, right? You guys are right. There are smart cells there. Fine. If you look at the lymphocyte, can I say the size of the lymphocyte is almost nor the size of a normal lymphocyte which is like a size of an rbc yes right it's not big whenever you see smart cell again this for post graduates do not jump into the diagnosis of cll smart cell isn't just a weak cell which can be seen in many many conditions when you see smart cells you have to make sure i am seeing lymphocytes which is also suggestive of cll if you see the same cell let's assume if the cell is this big will you still call it a cll you won't right it should be mature appearing lymphocytes the size of the lymphocytes should be almost like the of a normal lymphocyte and like azumi said that the chromatin should be like a golf ball right so smart cells can be seen in many many condition the commonest one obviously is cll right since i have lymphocytosis and all of them are mature appearing lymphocytes and i do have your smart cells here my diagnosis is cll this anyone can write right? it is not a very difficult diagnosis to write a cll right my question next is after reporting it as cll what will you follow the wording with because my impression is my impression should not go as cll impression chronic lymphoproliferative disorder most likely chronic lymphoid leukemia i'll come to the location most likely chronic lymphoid leukemia and what do you advise because i cannot call it cll just based on the smart cell and the appearance of this uh, nucleus do we want do you want to look for any more cells and what else do you want to advise for the physician
first thing you have to count the number of pro myelo pro lymphocytes fine that's important whenever you see a patient with a CLL don't end with CLL please count the number of pro lymphocytes and comment on the number of pro lymphocytes pro lymphocytes will be bigger than your uh, small lymphocyte you will have a prominent nucleoli and little bit abundant cytoplasm right the amount of pro lymphocytes should be less than 10 if it is 11 to 55 i call it CLL bar PLL PLL stands for pro lymphocytic leukemia if it is more than 55% pro lymphocytes i call it pro lymphocytic leukemia not as CLL right so you have to count the number of pro lymphocytes whenever you have a case of CLL that's first right second as you guys said that you have to advise flow cytometry i don't want a bone marrow examination here flow should be done on your peripheral smear only right okay uh, lokesh your first question of uh, why do we see, see smart cells the answer is given by Devraj. Uh, the loss of vimentin in these lymphocytes makes them a little bit weak because the cytoskeleton is vimentin which makes them a bit weak so when i smear them it becomes smudged fine okay okay um, Lokesh, your second question is uh, monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis. Okay. So if you know monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, the way to differentiate it from CLL is again going back to my Kutter value. Uh, the criteria for CLL is my absolute lymphocyte count. When I have an absolute uh, lymphocyte count more than 5000, I'm going to call it CLL. Can I say this patient has definitely has an absolute lymphocyte count more than 5000? This is your lymphocyte count. The lymphocyte count alone here is 53,000. So there is no uh, query of monoclonal basal lymphocytosis here, right? If you have lymphocytosis, less than 5000 absolute lymphocyte count, and you do a flow cytometry where the lymphocyte count is clonal, then I call it monoclonal basal lymphocytosis, fine? Since here it is 53,000 over the roof, it has to be a CLL, fine? Okay. So the perfect case of a CLL, right? Okay, uh, we'll just have a quick look about, we did see about RBCs in the previous class, uh, the different types of RBCs, what all is required and what all we have to report whenever you see something abnormal, right? So I'll just, I'm going to give you three flowcharts to evaluate a case of anemia. Uh, uh, these flowcharts are from Daisy Lewis. At least for the initial part, if you're posted in hematology, I want you to take a screenshot, uh, maybe print out a flowchart and stick it there above your PG room, fine? Because it might be required. Most of the anemias, you will have to evaluate based on these flowcharts. Most of them will fit into the flowcharts, fine? Okay. okay. Uh, it's not on peripheral smear location, it's more on the value wise and a flow cytometry wise. You cannot pick up monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis on a peripheral smear, fine? Okay. The first thing, if my MCV or an MCH is low, you have to look for the peripheral smear and you want ferritin levels. Whenever you have a microcytic anemia, there is no way you are going to evaluate the patient without a ferritin or your iron studies, right? In the blood smear, what you're going to look for is basophilic stippling because one of the possibilities of microcytic anemia is your lead poisoning. There are a few more things in addition to this. You have to look for Pappenheimer body. Okay. Pappenheimer body will be seen in which disease? Uh, Debraj, that's a very ideal situation which you have to look for. Uh, uh, if a patient comes with a history and the clinical presentation, if the treating physician really gives me the history and the clinical presentation, I'll be more than happy to report, right? But unfortunately, it comes with the name, sometimes with age, sometimes even without age, just a blood. So that's how we have to evaluate. Hopefully when you become a physician, uh, please do write the history because you know the importance of history. Without history, I am blinded, right? Hopefully that happens in future, fine. Okay, if my ferritin is low, there's no doubt it has to be an iron anemia, fine. I'm not going to ask for other iron studies. Uh, serum ion TABC might be required, but ferritin is more or less enough for me to evaluate patients, right? If ferritin is normal, RBC values are high. When I say RBC is high, uh, the number, uh, which means uh, the 5.5 million those things right if the number of rbc is high and my hemoglobin is normal or near normal which means my possibility here is tal because rbc being high means when rbc is high it means that i am going to deal with a patient with an hemolytic anemia that's all fine 
So whenever you have a picture of a microcytic anemia with increased heart BC count and normal ferritin, my diagnosis here, uh, suggest two of your thalassemia. Think of hemoglobin electrophoresis or an HPLC for its thalassemia trait. And there are many, many varieties of variant hemoglobin, right? When I say variant hemoglobin, hemoglobin C also will be microcytic. Hemoglobin E also will be microcytic. There are multiple other variant hemoglobins. Though the common one is beta thalassemia, it could be anything else. Keep that in mind, fine? If you go to Wintropes, there's an entire chapter on variant hemoglobins. Whenever you have time, if you have a PG presentation, just have a look at that, fine? Next. If my ferritin is normal or high, and my RBC is, as well as hemoglobin is reduced, right? Look for clinical features. Bone marrow iron is not required. I right? though this flowchart says that you have to do a bone marrow iron. It is uh, not advisable to go for a bone marrow examination when you're going to suspect anemia of chronic disease. Again, even for a microcytic patient, I want you to suspect anemia of chronic disease, right? Though it is normocytic predominantly, microcytic also will help. And ferritin is not always high in anemia of chronic disease. It could be on the upper limit of normal also, right? Think of anemia of chronic disease. Ask for the history, such as two of that, fine? Right? If you have any patient with my low MCV, this is your flow chart. Sideroblastic anemia, if papanima bodies are there. Other rare cause of microcytosis after ruling out all other things, fine? Okay. If my MCV is low, unfortunately it's in that, in that corner, fine? If my MCV is high, what do I do? Because I, high MCV can be either macrocytosis or megaloblastic picture. Whatever is required is there. Blood film is must to look for, like in the first case, I have to look for your uh, hypersegmentation or everything. B12 serum folate, yes. Required if you suspect your megaloblastic. Retic count. Retic count is important. For my microcytic anemia, we never advise retic count. I don't want retic count much because thalassemia's retic count might not be elevated much. Fine. Uh, as I said, Anuj, uh, citroblastic anemia, if you see microcytic picture, and if you rule out all these, and there are a few things called as papanema bodies, if you pick them up, then suspect cytoblastic anemias. Fine? Okay? Fine. The drug history is must because most of the anti-cancer drugs, your zidovudins, your many drugs can cause macrocytosis. Alcohol, especially for your liver disease or folate-induced macrocytosis. Fine? Okay. Again, thyroid function test because hypothyroidism can also cause macrocytosis. Right? These are important. See, uh, the difference between you being normal or extraordinary is this. Everyone is going to see the peripheral smear. Everyone is going to see the CBC. But if you really care about the patient, uh, at least when you're doing a postgraduate time, or if you work in a hospital, you will have all the information in the software called as HIS. You'll have hospital information software where everything will be there. So you see a tiny patient of mine, macrocytosis, look for the LFT, abnormal, right? Macrocytic anemia, probably due to liver deficiency, liver problem. Thyroid function is abnormal, right? Macrocytic anemia, probably due to hypothyroidism. So once that is treated, this automatically gets treated, right? So your goal is to give a definitive diagnosis. As a pathologist, giving a presumptive diagnosis is wrong. And uh, I don't like to write correlate clinically. I, as much as possible, I want you also to avoid the correlate clinically, fine? If you have all these value in the hospital inflammation system, great. If not, please ask the physician to provide them, fine? If my diagnosis is clear in sense, MDS. Keep this in mind. Generally, MDS is something which is missed a little bit. Whenever you have an elderly patient, like 50, 60 year plus, with a macrocytic anemia, my first possibility should be MDS. In MDS, there are lots of peripheral smear findings. We might see them in the subsequent classes, fine? Vitamin B12 of folate deficiency, it's more of a serological finding, but I do have the hypersegmented neutrophil, which has surrogate evidences for me, fine? If the diagnosis is not clear, what do I do is where my retic count comes into the play. Because not all myelodysplastic syndrome can be picked up on a peripheral smear. Uh, when I say myelodysplastic syndrome, am I right in saying that the dysplasia can be in RBC, WBC or platelets? Is that okay? Or it should be in everything. Dysplasia can be unilineage, dysplasia can be multilineage as well, right? Macrocytosis per se is a dysplastic RBC. Basophilic stippling is per se is a dysplasia, right? So all of them can be seen in a megaloblastic anemia also. So I might not have WBC abnormalities in your peripheral smear. Only RBC abnormalities will be there. NRBC is also a dyspoiesis. 
So they have only RBC abnormality. It will be difficult for me to push into a diagnosis of MDS. So that time I might ask for a bone marrow aspect. Again, I need to do a reticulocyte count. If my retic count is low, then I need a bone marrow aspect because MDS uh, for this I don't want anything. MDS and aplastic anemia. For both this, I need a bone marrow examination. For all intents and purposes, aplastic anemia might have normocytic anemia predominantly. They can also have macrocytic anemia. Keep that in mind. This is not for undergrads. For postgrads, a aplastic anemia can be macrocytic also. Keep that in mind. Fine. If retic count is low, there's some problem with the bone marrow, some failure in the bone marrow. Ask for a bone marrow examination. If retic count is high, ignore it. Because uh, a macrocytic anemia, because what we started the flowchart with is an MCV or MCH being high. That's all right. When your MCV is high, uh, if I have let's say 20% reticulocytes, 20% is huge, right? Can I say reticulos reticulocyte is a precursor of RBC? Will definitely be bigger than the size of RBC? Yes or no? A normal reticulocyte will it definitely be bigger than the size of a normal RBC? Yes. So when the reticulocyte count increases, there'll be a false elevation of the RB, uh, your MCV, right? Keep that in mind. Retic count can falsely elevate my main corpuscular volume. So it might present as a macrocytic anemia on the coulter. So retic is high, there's something hemolytic anemia, I'm going to look for the cause of hemolysis. Or if it's an acute blood loss, I go for an acute blood loss, right? Retic can falsely elevate the MCV value. Keep that in mind, okay? Next, if MCV is normal, Again, this is a very, very good flowchart. All these flowcharts are there in Daisy Lewis. Uh, I, I hope you have the uh, ebook of Daisy Lewis. If you don't have, I will share it in the uh, Telegram group for postgraduates. There's a group called Pathology Books and Pathology Library uh, in Telegram. Most of the books are available there. Please go ahead with that. Fine. Okay. If MCV is normal or MCG is normal, I'm going to look for the peripheral blood smear. If you have anemia with normal MCV MCH, the first thing itself, I'm going to start with the retic count only. If retic count is high, my diagnosis is easy, either one of these, look for the possibility and look for the diagnosis. What type of hemolysis is present? Is there any other surrogate finding of hemolytic anemia and the peripheral smear? Based on that, I'm going to go, uh, go my diagnosis through, fine. If my retic count is either normal or low, in both the conditions, I want a bone marrow. Because when I have a normocytic anemia, where my anemia of chronic disease is ruled out and my retic count is normal or low, it could either be a secondary anemia due to inflammation or an acute renal disease or something. If it's an abnormal bone marrow finding, it could be aplastic which is hypocellar marrow where retic will be low. Uh, like we discussed in the cases, it could be myelofibrosis, leukemia infiltration, metastasis. If it's dyspoietic, it could be MDS. Fine. All of them can have normocytic anemia. Again, if you see here, MDS overlaps with normocytic anemia as well as macrocytic anemia. Whatever you read as an undergraduate, like uh, and aplastic is normocytic, and anemia of chronic disease is normocytic. It's not like that. A disease doesn't read a textbook. The disease behaves the way it wants. So when whenever you become a postgraduate, even the subtle findings of saying that it can also be macrocytic, it can also be normocytic is important because that's what gives you a differential diagnosis, right? So if it's normal bone marrow morphology, I think of any secondary cause of anemia. If it's an abnormal morphology, I'm going to think of these few disorders, right? This is what you're going to do when your MCV is normal in case of an um, anemia patient, fine? Okay. And I think uh, what we are going to have next is a WBC. So I will keep WBCs for the next session. Hopefully I will try to give you the real cases, whatever I get. If you want that in the subsequent session, definitely we'll have it. Again, if you're a postgraduate, if you're an undergraduate, we will be having Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, special class on the Anacademy app. You are more than welcome to watch it. We are going the subject uh, chapter-wise revision for MCQs. If you're a postgraduate, and if you're a JR1, the newly joined JR1, we'll be having it on Fridays on the Anacademy app. If you are in second year or third year, uh, you, you are welcome to join the first year class as well if you want to refresh it. For JR2 and JR3, we are dealing with soft tissue pathology. It will be on uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. I might not be a bit regular on these. 
i i try to be on time on for these things uh, if i have any change of plan i'll definitely intimate you uh, in the telegram group if you're in the telegram group for postgraduates great if not just uh, search in the telegram pathology for postgraduates or ping me i'll definitely share you the link fine okay do you have any doubts in today's class if you have any doubts uh, more than happy to answer then na uh yes like i said here see it's normal or low uh ft low why uh, i have kept it as why the flow charts says that mds is either normal or low reticus so it's myelodysplastic syndrome right so can i have a myelodysplastic syndrome with abnormalities only in the platelet lineage is that a possibility have you, read, you must have read about uh, mds 5q deletion right which is predominantly in platelet lineage problem right so when i have a problem only with the platelet lineage i can have a normal reticular count right so that's why i said it can be either normal or low yes predominantly it will be low only because there's a problem in the myeloid uh, problem in the blast if one particular blast is affected it might change a little bit fine is that clear ft love any other questions queries if i know i'll definitely answer if i don't know definitely i'll read back and i'll definitely answer for you because more the questions you ask more better everyone becomes okay uh, taha you should uh, teach all of us regarding the smart cells wherever you see because you are doing a hemat path fellowship hopefully that's very good going as well for you see uh, when we say smart cells it is just just a degenerating cell right uh, in many many leukemias most of the leukemias most of the proliferative disorders when the amount of proliferation increases uh, in the bone marrow there will be definitely little bit of compression amongst the cells then this overcrowding there right so it kind of destroys the uh, vimentil so i can have them in few leukemias as well any leukemias any leukocytosis condition can have smart cells but having said that the first possibility is obviously cll you have to look for your normal lymphocytes you can have your um, Uh, let's say a mantle cell lymphoma spillover can have destroyed cells right it's much like cells so don't ignore them it, because a mantle cell lymphoma spillover will not have a perfectly round lymphocyte it'll have lots of cleaving in the uh, nuclear membrane that will help you to come to a diagnosis fine right? ah uh, lokesh uh, flow charts for genetic causes of uh, iron deficiency anemia i would say it's a it's a very very rare scenario the maximum you can encounter them is in a theoretical question i think you'll definitely able to answer that fine again it's it's irda it's more of a theoretical question uh, in a real life practice you are it's it's a very very rare possibility to encounter a genetic form of an iron deficiency anemia fine i'll share you articles uh, regarding the differences if that might help you fine okay will in thalassemia what will happen to reticulocyte count See what happens in thalassemia is uh, it is said that um, I'll tell you. Let's take thal. I'm sure you know the pathogens of thal. In thalassemia, we do have something called as an ineffective erythropoiesis, right? We do have something called as an ineffective erythropoiesis. When you have an ineffective erythropoiesis, uh, uh, thank you, Fdilov. The thalassemia, the bone marrow will try to produce RBCs because the hematopoiesis happens. There will be an expansion for sure. but unfortunately because of a genetic defect half of them dies inside the bone marrow itself they don't come outside so again and again and again bone marrow is going to try the same so what happens here is since there is less amount of survival it's not due to the less amount of production fine since the survival becomes less the amount of rbcs which come outside will be more than normal but it will not be elevated as um, i expect in a hemolytic anemia 
if you have seen cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia the percentage of reticon easily will be like 7 8 9 thalassemia even if at all major the degree of hemolysis is very very high in spite of that it is said that tal myretic uh, rpa will be less than 2.5 and generally it's said that retic count in a thalassemia will be less than 3 percent 1.5 is the upper limit of normal in adult it's less than 3 percent which means it's slightly high elevated but not too much elevated for the degree of hemolysis fine hope i am clear on it well okay okay uh, Shri Devi, why an hypercellular marrow in myelofibrosis? Great question, right? So when you see myelofibrosis, what happens is uh, the cellularity of the fibrotic thing is there. One is your uh, myelofibrosis will have lots and lots and lots of megakaryocytic proliferation, right? The MEGs are the reason for causing the fibrosis because a megakaryocyte can release platelet rate growth factors, the abnormal ones. That platelet rate growth factors kind of uh, acts like the fibrotic initiating forces, right? So every myelofibrosis will have lots and lots of microcytes and there'll be caught up cells in between the fibrotic phase, right? So when I take cellularity, the amount of cells between the fibrotic phase is still normal plus increasing amount of microcytes gives an appearance of an hypercellular marrow, that's all. Is that clear? Any other doubt? Most welcome, Will. Okay, if there are no other doubts, can we call it play? Great. See you soon next Friday if you are a JR1 or if you are a postgraduate, please download the Anacademy app which is there. The link will be there below this uh, video description. You can unlock any of my uh, special classes. If you go under my profile, select the special classes. They will be starting with PG courses. I will share the links with, of whatever class you want in the Telegram group as well. Fine. Hopefully we will learn more together uh, in the journey of a pathology residency. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patient listening and see you soon. Bye-bye. Good night.